another LDI based video on immunological related issues. This one about mast cell disorders or what are, you know, said to be mast cell activation disorder problems. What I'm going to say on this subject is probably going to upset certain people. It's going to conflict with a lot of the other infl information you've been given on the subject. I almost said inflammation you've been given on the subject, which is about the same thing in this case. <laughs> um, and it's, it's a different idea behind what's going on. So I'll just say that there theoretically there is such a thing as mast cell activation disorder where the mast cells themselves, and if you haven't done your research, a mast cell is an immune system effector cell. Sort of, you know, it's not necessarily one of the, it's not one of the white blood cells that circulates in your bloodstream. They live in your tissues here and there, positioned everywhere. They're boots on the ground, you know, um, immune reactor cells. They house histamine inside them um, and some other chemicals that mediate local inflammatory and, and immune reactions. And they get a signal from somewhere else, normally, some other you know, antibody or cell mediated response in the immune system to let go of their granules and spew their histamine out. So what histamine does at a, at a tissue level is cause dilation and relative leakage of your capillaries, your blood vessels in the area. So that's sort of a logistics thing for the military of your immune system so that the white blood cells that are in your bloodstream, when they go to the site of inflammation, they can easily get out of the bloodstream into the tissue right in that area. So histamine causes opening up of the blood vessels preferentially right at that site locally so that that's where they're drawn to with a greater amount of blood flow. And then it causes leakage or you know relative leakage of those blood vessels so that they can leave the blood vessel and go out into the tissue to fight whatever's there to fight. So that's the purpose of histamine. <laughs> it's something we've had in our body for a very long time. Um, the annoying part of a histamine reaction is symptoms of itching, primarily. You know, it, it'll, get, it'll give you itching. We don't really understand neurologically, like in terms of what nerves and what part of the brain carries itching. It's a super annoying sensation. Um, and we just have to be, deal with it. But that's what histamine sort of does. <clears throat> if you eat histamine... I'm getting a little off track on this subject here, but talking about histamine. If you eat foods that are high in histamine, that should not cause any kind of reaction. The histamine molecule in the food isn't being delivered into your subcutaneous tissue somewhere, and it isn't going to the site of inflammation. But if you have a generally very high activation state of your immune system, and you have a lot of histamine-related sort of things going on here and there in the body... Some people will notice that consuming foods that are relatively high in histamine seems to add fuel to that fire. It's important to realize that that doesn't mean you're, quote, allergic or reactive to high histamine foods. It's just adding more substrate, more of that thing to the equation for you so it, gets, it, it accentuates what's going on already. Um, so anyway, there is such a thing as mast cell activation disorder. People can have a problem with their mast cells themselves where they're no longer following orders from above like they're supposed to. They're just firing, you know, just going off for no apparent reason without specific triggers having um, caused it. That is exceedingly rare, like exceedingly rare. There's this thing called mastocytosis where you can actually get sort of little tumors comprised of mast cells in localized areas, but they tend to set it off enough histamine release collectively that you can get systemic kinds of symptoms from it. Um, but for every one person who has true mastocytosis or a true mast cell activation disorder, nowadays, thanks to the, you know, kind of, I think, misinformation out there in the world of integrative medicine, you're going to see a thousand people or more who have been led to believe they have a mast cell disorder and don't. Uh, so that's who I'm talking about. I mean, if you have true mastocytosis... That sucks. I mean, it's a very, very rare problem. I don't think there's a role for LDI in that case. Um, and you just end up having to take medications that block histamine, you know, antihistamines and mast cell stabilizer things and whatnot, because there isn't even something you can locally remove surgically. It's not like a single tumor. It's this kind of more widespread thing. But I don't want those of you watching the video to believe for one minute that that's actually what you have and that LDI won't work for you, because... 
-hmm. it's very, very much more likely, 99.99% more likely that you do not have real mast cell activation disorder in that sense. More likely your mast cells are firing a lot because you are in fact allergic or sensitive to some things, some actual antigen triggers. And it just has gotten out of hand. You've either had so many new triggers created so that so many different things will elicit this response pattern now and it starts to seem like you react to literally everything or there's this just global you know, response pattern. Or you're allergic to a small number of things but it's gone on long enough that now your mast cells just have PTSD. They just they have a hair trigger and they'll degranulate, they'll release their histamine, they'll respond to minimal stimulus now. And in fact, it gets to the point in people where mechanical stimulation will do it, like dragging your finger across your skin, right? You drag your finger on the skin and this red welt shows up. We call that dermatographia, which means you can write on your skin. Um, that's a sign that your mast cells are just super on edge. They have a hair trigger. Even physical mechanical stimulus will set them off. That doesn't mean you're allergic to your fingernail, right? It doesn't mean you're allergic to your own skin, and it doesn't mean you have mastocytosis either. It's just this very heightened DEFCON 12, whatever, you know, level of activation of your immune system in a general way. But it starts with a sensitivity to discrete individual antigens. It's just that it escalates to that point. Once it gets to that point, somebody will diagnose you with mast cell disorder because they see you that day walking in um, and say, oh my gosh, this is where you are today. But what you have to do to solve this puzzle, so when I work with people that have this kind of issue, is think back, like how did it begin? What were some of the first things that you ever in your life knew would set off any kind of allergic reaction for you? Most likely those initial things were smaller in number, they were, they were more discreet, and the reactions were a lot more minor too, a lot milder, probably nothing like they are today at diagnosis or at the time I see people. So when I get a hold of the people that have been told they have mast cell activation disorder, how you are today is not a very useful thing to determine what's causing it, like what are the root causes upstream? You have to think back in your history. Okay, well, the first thing I noticed I reacted to was milk. Or the first thing that I started to notice I reacted to was shellfish or nuts. Uh, you know, and, or tree pollens or dust or mold. Or I lived in a really moldy house for a while and had all this prolonged exposure. And then I started to get all these just bombastic cascading symptoms around my body after a while. But it's that initial history, thinking back historically, that helps us figure out what we have to treat that person with in order to correct the whole thing downstream. Because it still is a downstream issue. You build a dam over that initial like watershed there, and then all of this chaos that they're living with day after day can, in fact, stop. And I've had success with this many times. It's just difficult. Because when you're in this current daily existence, the desire is to express to the practitioner just how miserable everything is right now. And, and if everybody focuses on that and how you are today... All you end up with is a bunch of symptomatic therapies. You end up with quercetin and um, bromelain and antihistamines, H1 and H2 blockers, singular, chromalin of whatever form, gastrochrom or inhaled, you know, all of these things, steroids maybe, just to stop the end result in this cascade. But what I have to do with people is try to dig back and figure out how it started, what some of the inciting antigens might be, and then find those doses for them. And that's a challenge in the midst of this chaos. It's like trying to find one snowball in a blizzard um, sometimes for people. But that's what you have to do. So people can get to the point where their nervous system is involved. So you may notice that when you eat anything, um, just the act of swallowing and stretching your esophagus and stomach, even if you drink a bunch of water at one time, that mechanical stimulus, just like dragging a fingernail across your skin is a mechanical stimulus to the cells in that tissue. Anything you eat, every time you eat, sets off this cascade of often autonomic nervous system reactions, which can include panic and anxiety. It can include um, sweating, heart palpitations, dizziness, fatigue. It can include just bowel evacuation, nausea, or horrible acid reflux if it goes this way, and diarrhea if it goes the other way. 
it can set off the same set of symptoms like that no matter what you eat. And this is a really key thing to understand in people who have responses to food, right? If you have the same exact symptom response to 50 different foods, what are the odds that you're actually allergic to each of those 50 foods and have the same symptom pattern? The odds are infinitesimal, okay? That's probably not what's going on. You're probably not allergic to all of those actual foods. You're allergic to the mechanical act of eating. And so that's the kind of thing I ask about and sort through. And people go, yeah, it's all the same. You might have some specific food sensitivities. Say, I have that whole pattern of symptoms, you know, the things I just listed, when I eat anything. But I know if I eat nuts, I'll also get mouth itching and I'll vomit. And I don't do that with anything else, you know. So you look for clues like that. Like, what's different? What's not the same? What's not part of this homogenous chaos that you're dealing with day in and day out? And so when I work with these people, that's the, that's the process. Um, I want to know what's going on with them at the time, day after day, but don't focus on that for too long. Don't perseverate on that because it's not the key to answering the question. It's not the, the key to solving the problem, it turns out. So you want to find those other things that are unique. What else, what do you react to that's different in some way from everything else? It may involve that whole typical pattern, your standard response pattern, plus other things. And that's what you look for. And it could be airborne stuff. It could be dust. It could be mold. It could be chemicals in your environment that set off some of these things for you too. So it's not always a food issue. Uh, that's probably the most common. But often it's become multifactorial. You react to more than one category of allergen and you react um, to many of them. So we, we sort it out. The nice thing about using LDI or LDA or one of these broader kind of antigen approaches in this context is that you take advantage of cross-reactivity and you use a whole bunch of foods at once so that you don't have to just guess correctly about one thing, right? It can be this umbrella approach to spreading tolerance and we can get this to calm down more successfully. People can also be reactive to gastrointestinal organisms like yeast or parasites or H. pylori or some other thing that lives in the gut. So that's some of the questioning we have to ask people. So it can be solved. Um, one theory that I had about these disorders was that maybe some of you have started reacting to histamine itself because it would seem like I, I eat something or I have some minor exposure that triggers this little reaction and it always just cascades into this broad, crazy reaction from there. And I thought, well, maybe that person's allergic or immunologically reactive to the histamine molecule itself. So you release a little bit of it and then it's just this accelerant process where it explodes into a bonfire, even from this little effect. So I have a histamine LDI that's histamine and histidine, histidine being the amino acid from which histamine is derived. And I've tried that with a number of people that seem to have this clinical pattern, and it has not yet worked for any of them. So now I, I don't think that it's very likely that any of the people with this clinical pattern have a histamine sensitivity, not in that sense. Do they release a lot of histamine in a cascading effect? Yes, but I think it's still always triggered by some other thing, some actual antigen reaction that starts it at the beginning. So that's the game. That's how we solve this problem for those people, and I do have a fair amount of success with it. Mechanistically and just in a pure science aspect, it's, it's potentially very successful. The difficulty I run into with this category of patient and this disorder is that their current existence is so chaotic that they have trouble focusing on the things I want them to focus on. They just continue to, to notice that their life is hell every day. It's hard to not notice that. Um, and it's hard to focus on, well, do I still react to carrots differently like I used to? I, it's hard for me to get them to focus their attention on things a certain way um, in the midst of all that misery that you're dealing with. So that's a challenge. And the other thing is the belief. So people have very staunch beliefs about what's put out there on the internet about mast cell activation disorder, and I have a very hard time unbrainwashing them about that thought pattern. If you continue to just perseverate on those beliefs and that thought pattern, people can't hear what I'm trying to explain to them. They, they won't focus their attention on the things I need them to focus their attention on. They don't give me the information that I need. They just want to talk about how horrible everything is now and how they have mast cell disorder. 
And we have to get past that. We have to logically proceed through this process and not just get totally mired down in that, that chaotic state of existence in the now that you have. So that's a challenge for some people. Um, and a lot of them also, because they're so sick at baseline, have a tendency to think that every dose they take makes them worse because it's really hard to tell when, you know, hellish symptoms become super hellish symptoms. Um, it's, it's very difficult to tell. And it's so miserable that people have a, sometimes a tendency to just think it's worse and, and react in that way and want to back off. And, and um, it can be challenging to tell. I always try to push people, let's go a little, let's go stronger and see if you see something different happen or the same. Because more and more data points help you figure out what's really going on with people. Um, and then I use placebo doses for people in this instance too. So we can very clearly determine, are these your baseline symptoms that you're interpreting differently because you took an LDI dose? Or is this really different from your baseline symptoms? And I have to learn that about some people. Um, so if we, if we end up working together, just follow my guidance and suggestions. I always want to know what you think. And we, we try to make decisions together. But if I start really urging you to go a certain direction, you should. Uh, otherwise, we're, we're going to get nowhere. The only time I really try to push people is when it's become more clear based on more information and data and my experience dealing with this that we're moving in the wrong direction. And I really try to urge people to go the other way if we're ever going to figure it out because that's the goal, solving the problem for you. So if we work together... Just know that I'm on your side and we're trying to figure this out and I've done this a number of times and if you think things are manifesting a certain way and I have a different opinion, I've, I have a different perspective that's more likely to be right, actually, uh, which isn't just arrogance, it's just experience and the reality and we need to work together to figure it out. So try to follow the lead and the guidance and we will do our best to solve this really difficult problem for as many people as possible. Thanks.